Uh, hello everyone, uh, this is me, Ahmed uh, al Garhi, and I will be moderating the session. Uh, as you know, this is the third session in, um, uh, in the course of uh, practical applications of uh, digitalization in the oil and gas industry by engineer Marwa Hassan. Uh, engineer Marwa Hassan uh, uh, is the global production uh, technical marketing manager for Schlumberger uh, digital and integration uh, segment. Uh, Marwa holds uh, a master's degree in nuclear uh, energy from Alexandria uh, University in Egypt. Uh, also, uh, Marwa has long experience uh, in uh, teaching and giving a presentation. She already gave uh, more than 200 courses and technical presentation. Please uh, give all your attention to engineer Marwa. Uh, as you know, this is a third lecture. Uh, today, you will, you will get your third quiz. So try to submit your quizzes uh, on time. And also, if you have any uh, question, please leave it in the Q&A section. And at the end of the lecture, I will uh, do my best to ask as many questions as possible based on the time we have. And now, uh, Engineer Marwa, the mic, uh, mic is yours. Thank you, Ahmed, very much for, uh, for this introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm very pleased to be with you again for our third session. Um, you will hear a lot about Digital Twin. Uh, it's one of the current major trends in the oil and gas industry. Uh, you will hear this word a lot and see wide competition between major oil and gas companies to deploy it and invent more. Uh, and this is our topic for today. Um, in this session, we will take some time to learn about definition of Digital Twin, uh, the wide definition, and also uh, the definition from oil and gas perspective the different types of digital twin, why the oil and gas industry is eager to take advantage of this invention, and what's included in a digital twin. In general, a digital twin can be defined uh, generally, uh, uh, fundamentally as an evolving digital profile of the historical and current behavior of a physical object or process that helps optimize business performance. What does that mean? It means that, as you can see on the figure, you have uh, let's say that this is a control room, and what you want to do is you want digitally to be able to uh, analyze the data and analyze the, the performance of this operating room and understand the behavior of this function. The digital twin is based on massive cumulative real-time, real-world data measurements across any array of dimensions. These measurements can create an evolving profile of the object or process in the digital world that may provide important insights on system performance, leading to an actions in the physical world, such as a change in a product design or manufacturing process. In the oil and gas industry, a digital in the event of cloud computing, now you know we're using cloud computing, we're using machine learning algorithm and rapid computing power that has made the idea of integrating all data together a practical reality. Smart components containing sensors are used to gather data about the real-time status, working conditions, and position of a physical item, such as an engine, a well, or even an offshore drilling rig. The data is sent to a cloud-based system, which stores and analyzes it, combining it with and comparing it to other relevant data. So that when simulates the physical object, additional information integrated with the sensor data into the twin includes engineering content such as <clears throat> pressure, temperature, diagrams, specifications, as well as financial considerations and uncertainties like weather, for example, or customer demand, uh, supply disruption, um, uh, the reduction in, in, in oil cost, for example. Updating is it's constantly and in real time, so fast decisions can be made using all available information. This creates a bridge between the physical and the digital world. So you don't need, so what does that mean in practical ideas? It means that uh, usually in, a, in, in the well, you, you, you practice things on the spot. So you try a new machine or you try a new uh, ESP pump uh, by using it on the well itself. However, with a digital twin, you can, before you apply a new product, before you do perforation, before you uh, uh, upload um, or install a new ESP pump, 
you're able through the digital twin to simulate the functionality of this new ESP pump and decide if this will be appropriate for your performance of the well or not. Now let's talk about the elements that define a digital twin. Usually when people use digital twin, it's, it's a very big uh, word because it, can, it includes uh, many elements within its performance. So in the, in the figure that you see uh, right now, there are five uh, enabling components that can tell you that this is a digital twin. Sensors and acuters, actuators from the physical world, integrating data and analytics, as well as continuously updating digital twin applications. So what we're trying to do here is we have the physical process. We have a well, we have a rig, we have a, a machine or a control room. And we're trying to represent this on a digital world so that we can understand the performance of the machine or the well that we have. The components that we're gonna talk about are the sensors, first of all. Sensors distributed throughout the, the, the process create signals that enable the twin to capture operational and environmental data pertaining the physical process in the real world. The status of your well, the pressure, can be loaded and feeded, feeded to, your, uh, uh, to, your, to your digital twin. Data, real world operational and environmental data from the sensor are then aggregated. So the quality of the data needs to be, uh, uh, needs to be um, uh, modified and combined with data from the enterprise. What do we mean by data from the enterprise? We mean that, for example, uh, uh, the cost of the materials or the enterprise systems such as uh, HR system or for example, of the well, the history of the well, the interventions that you're doing to the well. Data may also contain other items such as engineering drawings, connections to external data feeds and customer complaints logs, for example. The third element is integration. So sensors communicate the data to the digital world through integrating technology such as edge communication interfaces, security between the physical world and the digital world and vice versa. Fourth element is analytics. It's very important to include analytics because what you want is not only to know the status of uh, your well <coughs> or your rig, but you also want to know uh, uh, um, the perspective of what's gonna happen on my well and what actions I need to take to prevent any failure or to prevent any issue within my well. So analytic techniques are used to analyze the data through algorithmic simulations and visualization routines that are used by the digital twin to produce insights. And then the last element, uh, sorry, the, the, fifth ele the fourth element is the digital twin, which is representation of your physical digital side in, in, in uh, or what you see on the right hand side on the figure is the digital twin itself, an application, a, a, a computer application that combines the components above into a near real time digital model of the physical world and process. The objective of a digital twin is to identify intolerable deviations from optimal conditions along any of the various dimensions. Your, your, your well is not behaving uh, as it should be. Your ESP pump is gonna fail. Your, uh, your production is, is being reduced. Uh, your completion is, uh, needs to be perforated. All the deviation from uh, uh, the optimal condition that you simulate within your uh, softwares is being identified, right? Such as a deviation in a, in, a, in a business optimization, either the twin has an error in the logic, which is hopefully not, or an opportunity for saving costs, improving quality, or achieving greater efficiency has been identified. So the system will tell you that if you're gonna replace this pump, for example, you're gonna have uh, an increase in the production. Now it's up to you as an engineer to be able to identify, is this something that you want to do in real life or are you happy with the performance of 
your uh, object, whether it's a well or ESP pump or anything. The resulting opportunity may result in an action back in the physical world. Now, <coughs> <coughs> sorry. Now, an action back in the physical world means that, for example, you need to choke the well or you need to uh, reduce the production. You need to change the speed of the ESP pump. And for that, we have what we call actuators. Now, those actuators uh, uh, help if an action should be warranted in the real world. The digital twin produce the action by way of actuators, subject to human intervention. So it's up to you to use uh, the actuators to change the, the, the performance of the machine or not. Clearly, the world of a physical process or an object and its digital twin analog are vastly more complex than a single model, of course, or a framework can predict. And of course, the model in, in this figure, it's just one digital twin configuration that focus on uh, manufacturing. So if you're doing a digital twin in drilling, this will change a lot. If you're doing a digital twin in, in uh, your geological model, this, this will be completely different than what we see here. But what our model aims to show is the integrated holistic and interactive quality of the physical and digital world. So, so we're trying to show how we integrate the physical world with the digital twin. Now, to create a digital twin, many companies right now, uh, like Shell, like Total, like Equinor, are uh, employing uh, petroleum engineers who have background on data analytics and data science to create a digital twin for them. The idea of creating a digital twin is not simple and it's not easy. However, there are many steps that we can take to ensure that this digital twin represents the physical world that we are trying to simulate. The first step for us is to create. The create step encompasses outfitting the physical process with, mer with merit sensors that measure critical inputs from the physical process and its surroundings. Meaning that I am creating a digital twin that will monitor the status of the well which means that the sensors needs to read pressure, it needs to read temperature, it needs to read any uh, uh, different aspects when it comes to the well behavior. The measurements by the sensors can be broadly classified into two categories, operational measurements pertaining to the physical performance criteria of the productive assets, including multiple works in progress, such as, uh, as we say, temperature, pressure, uh, the, uh, any, any uh, uniformity on, on, on the well behavior. And the second thing might be environmental, for example, or external data affecting the operation of physical assets, such as uh, uh, the ambient temperature, the pressure, uh, the, 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 the corrosion, for example. Uh, those are all uh, aspects that affect your well performance. The measurements can then, then be transformed into secure digital messages using encoders and transmitted into the digital twin. The signals from the sensors may be augmented with process-based information from systems such as uh, a manufacturing execution systems, for example, uh, um, an HR, uh, sorry, uh, uh, an enterprise uh, resource planning, for example or looking into uh, service companies' performance uh, if you're trying to, uh, um, to install an ESP pump or trying to, do, to create an intervention within your well, right? This would provide the digital twin with a wide range of continually updating data to be used as an input for, for its analytics and analysis. The second category is the communication. The communication step is very important. It helps the seamless real-time bi-directional integration and connectivity between the physical process and the digital platform. Network communication is one of the radical changes that have enabled the digital twin and it compromises three primary components. The first component is the edge processing. The edge processing, you will hear the word edge uh, hugely when you start working in the oil and gas industry because it created an invention and a huge invention in the oil and gas. The edge interface connects sensors and process historians. 
process signals and data from them, from, from them near the source and passes data along to the platform. This serves to translate proprietary protocols to more easily understood data formats, as well as reduce network communication. Major advances in this area have eliminated many bottlenecks that have limited the viability of a digital twin in the past. The second thing is communication interfaces. Communication interfaces help transfer information from the sensor function to the integration function. Many options are needed in this area, given that the sensor produce the insight can in theory be placed in at almost any location, depending on the digital twin configuration under consideration, right? Inside a factory, in a home, in a mining operation, or in a parking lot, if we're talking in general, not only on the oil and gas, right? The third part is the edge security. What does that mean? It means that new sensor and communication capabilities have created new security issues. You don't want your data to be uh, to be um, um, given into other producers or into other location. You want to keep it safe for your, proceed, for your uh, employees and your company and your organization. Uh, the most common security approaches are to use firewalls, application keys, encryption, and device certificates that needs for new solution to safely enable digital twins. Uh, and this will likely be pressing as more, as more assets become IP enabled. Now, after working on the edge, now, by the way, many companies right now, for example, if you're using a software like Pipesim or Petrel, many companies right now are using those simulation within the edge. So you're able, uh, not the simulation itself, but using um, um, algorithms that does simulation <clears throat> within the edge so that you quickly use the seconds and the minutes uh, of the real-time data or near real-time data that you're using for processing and getting information as quick as possible before, before even it reaches your data management protocol. The data aggregation, now the, the third part that we talk about is aggregation. Aggregation step can support data ingestion into data repository, processed and prepared for analytics. What does that mean? It means that you don't, as a production engineer or as a process engineer, as a GNG engineer, you don't want to have loads of data to deal with. You want your data to be uh, prepared so that it can be fed into the analytics algorithm or the analytics machine. The data aggregation and processing may be done either on the premises, which means on the edge as we talked, or in the cloud, on your data management system. The technology domains that power data aggregation and processing have evolved tremendously over the last few years in ways that allow designers to create massively scalable architectures with great ag 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 agility and at the fraction of the cost in the past. So right now, when people start to look into uh, production systems and data management, it's not as complicated and expensive as it used to be 10 or five years ago. Analysis of the data. So in the analysis step, data is analyzed and visualized. Data scientists and analysts can utilize advanced analytics platforms and technologies to develop in iterative models that generate insights and recommendations and guide decision making. So what we're trying to do with the digital twin is rather than you analyzing all the data that you're getting, we create an analytics algorithm that give you insights that tells you that your will is, uh, needs to be optimized production. Uh, the operating condition of your wealth, for example, can be uh, changed into specific conditions that can give you more production. Uh, the, the pumps can be, uh, speed of the pump can be reduced, for example. Uh, you can inject methanol to prevent wax, for example. So this is the unique identification of a digital twin which is what we call the insights. In the insights step, insights from the analytics are presented through dashboards with visualization, highlighting unacceptable differences in the performance of the digital twin model and the physical world analog in one or more dimensions, indicating areas that potentially need investigation and change. What does that mean? It means that your well, your well is producing 300 barrels per day, but your digital twin simulation tells you that this will can produce 
up to 600 barrels per day. And it gives you why the well is underperforming and how you can increase the performance of the well. And then the third, the sixth part that we're talking about is the action. The action is the act step is where actionable insights from the previous step from the insights itself can be fed back to the physical asset and digital process to achieve the impact of the digital twin. Insights pass through the decoders and are then fed into the actuators on the asset process, which are responsible for movement of or control mechanism. For example, you need to choke the well back so that you can reduce your production to prevent hydrate, for example. The signal, the, the digital twin will provide a signal to your choke to choke back the wells within the control room of your uh, rig. Now it's up to you as an engineer to accept this uh, process or not. All subject, of course, as we say, to human intervention. This interactions uh, com completes our closed loop connection between the physical world and the digital twins. We're trying to create a closed loop from the beginning where you're trying to get the data through the sensors up until the actions brought to you to the actuators on the real physical world. The digital twin application is usually written in the primary system language of the enterprise. So you can use Python, for example, you can use the C++ or you can use R uh, to decode uh, uh, the, the, the application itself uh, and use all the steps that are provided uh, to it. In addition, throughout the process, uh, standards and security measures may be applied for, uh, for purpose data management and interoperable connectivity. You need to manage the data, you need to make sure that the data is secure, you need to make sure that uh, uh, well data is not being uh, manipulated, and you need to understand who are the people responsible for changing the information. So if I am Marwa, uh, the user, who have uh, changed some of the data or, or accepted some of the actions, this also uh, needs to be um, clear. Uh, it's what we call an audit trail, which prevents uh, manipulation of the data or changes without uh, management approval or without uh, engineers approval. The computation power of big data engines, the versatility of the analytics techniques, the massive and flexible storage possibilities of the aggregation area and integration with, with chemical data allow the digital twin to model a much richer, less isolated environment than ever before. What do we mean by less isolated environment? As we've been talking on the previous two sessions, as a production engineer, you're working within the production systems. You are responsible for looking into uh, the ESP pumps, the well production, but you have a reservoir engineer who's looking into the reservoir properties looking into the completions. Digital twins unify or integrate the working environment between reservoir engineers, production engineers, process engineers, the geologists, so that you are not taking decision in isolation. And we've seen this a lot, and you will see it a lot when you start your practical work, that as a reservoir engineer, you, you rely a lot on reservoir simulation, giving you that, uh, for example, your well can uh, produce uh, 10,000 parents per day. But when you start to apply the constraints from your field, the constraints that you have in a network, for example, in the gathering center, on the facility, this production cannot be achieved within your field. So by, by integrating or by creating an environment that both engineers can work together, understanding the constraints of the complete field, this gives you a better decision-making profile. In turn, such developments may lead to a more sophisticated and realistic model, all with the potential of lower cost softwares and hardware. It's important to note that the above conceptual architecture should be designed for flexibility and scalability. What do we mean by that? It means that a digital twin should be scalable and flexible, meaning that whenever you change your procedure, whenever, whenever you change your um, software, uh, whenever you change uh, engineers, 
uh, this needs to be flexible and needs to be adapted to your uh, new system. So basically, this is the basics of how you create a digital twin. Remember this, remember the sensors, remember aggregating the data, remember the edge computation, and remember the analytics, which provides insights and actions. Now, what are, why do, uh, now we will look into digital twin benefits from a business perspective and from a, a technical perspective. Business values, usually this is what your higher organization looks for, your CEOs, your COOs are looking for. And we have here, I, I cannot list all the benefits, the business benefits of um, digital twin, but just for some summarize, we look into the quality, which is improving the overall quality of the system, uh, predicting and detecting quality trends defects sooner so sooner you know that you will have a failure on a specific spot, so you don't need to wait for the failure itself. Control the quality escapes and be able to determine when quality issues are started. The second part is related to the way you deal with the service companies, warranty cost and services. So you, you understand the configuration of the equipment, you bought a new ESP pump, and uh, you want to uh, evaluate between different service companies that provides ESP pumps for you. So uh, as, as we said before, instead of installing an ESP pump, you're able to evaluate which ESP pump is better for you to purchase in terms of cost and in terms of, of, of performance. Proactively and more accurately determine warranty and claims issues to reduce overall warranty cost and improve customer experience. What does that mean? It means that you've been dealing with a service company for a few years now you're able to evaluate the performance of the, of, of, uh, of the way they the, the, the do um, warranty for you or the way they perform a service for you. Many companies are using Schlumberger, for example, for wireline intervention or, or well interventions. Uh, through the years, how was the performance? Uh, are you happy? Is there something that can be added? This all contributes also to the quality itself. <coughs> The third part is operational cost. And this is huge when you're able to combine the physical model with the digital twin or the digital model that you have instead of relying on uh, the physical model. So improving the product design and engineering change execution, uh, improving performance and, and manufacturing equipment, reducing operational process variability, for example. A very important part that many companies do not look at it seriously is record retention. When you start working in an oil and gas company, uh, and let's say you're working in a mature field or a brown field uh, in the North Sea, this is a field that's been in operation for 30 or 40 years. Uh, it is very, very, very difficult to look into the history of the well of 30 years of creating interventions, of looking into what was done to the well and what was done to the field. But when you have a digital twin, this manual data and manual interventions and uh, PDF files, Excel files are all created to, to, to create a digital record for, of the intervention history of the well and improve the service performance evaluation. Now let's assume that you work in a green field and you're gonna add uh, a new well or you're gonna um, design a new facility adding it to the, to the field. What will happen when, when, when you start uh, using a digital twin is that you will reduce the time to production, mainly because you are evaluating things on a digital world. So you're able to see the performance and you're able to see the behavior before you even implement this on the field. So you, you are prepared and your engineers are prepared to all the issues that you will face. Reduce the overall cost of development and production and better understanding of impact to supply chain. And it's very important. I know you're all um, still engineers, but when you start working supply chain, or how much is the cost of the material? How much is the cost of, of the intervention that you want to create, adding a new well, designing a new facility, uh, using a specific service company instead of the other companies? It's very important for the companies, uh, uh, the companies uh, overall uh, 
overall performance. The last part is revenue growth opportunity. You're, usually as an engineer, you will be responsible of a task of creating the top opportunities of what should be done on each well and, and also on each field. By having a digital twin, you're able to identify the top opportunities that gives you quick production or quick cost savings. And of course, improve the efficiency and the cost to execute. This is from a business perspective. From an engineering perspective or from a technical perspective, you're looking into many also benefits when it comes to talking about digital twin. <coughs> One of the, uh, of the first important parts that uh, have changed dramatically the oil and gas performance is sharing the data across silos. Why? Because when you start working, you will see that each department have its own digital, uh, have its own, sorry, data management tool. So there is a data management tool for completions. There is a data management tool for production. There is a data management tool for operation. There is a data management tool for reservoir engineering. There is a data management tools for each department, which makes it very difficult to find the necessary information to, to create a meaningful uh, action or a meaningful insights. By using a digital twin, the proxy collect the data from the sensors and it's available for all engineers and it's available and it's used <clears throat> it's used in, in, in a process and a, and a workflow, not only in a software. This is a very important differentiation. What do we mean by that? We mean that as a production engineer, you're using Pipesim. So you're using production data into Pipesim. Digital Twin doesn't, doesn't uh, work this way. It works by, by understanding the relationship between the data sources and the workflows, meaning that if your workflow, uh, uh, if your workflow represents that you're going to use PipeSim for, uh, for example, flow rate estimation, and then you're going to use OFM for forecasting, and then you're going to use um, Eclipse, for example, for a, for a reservoir forecasting, a digital twin will use, will understand this relationship and will use necessary information collected from the sensors and collected from different databases into this workflow. It's very important, again, I'm highlighting, it's very important to understand that here we're not talking softwares, we're talking workflows. You are not only using software, you're using a workflow that will determine a specific value or a specific insight for you. The second important part is that you're managing operation in real time. So instead of collecting data manually every month, every day, every two weeks, for example, and relying on all data, you're able to collect data in seconds, in minutes, in hours. What does that mean? It means that it gives you a holistic picture of what the entity represents. It means that if you will, I'm going to give you a, a practical example. Uh, I used to be working in Kuwait, and in winter, the temperature in Kuwait in the morning can be, for example, uh, 25, and in the evening, it can be minus 4 or minus 6 in the field, which means that in the morning, you don't see uh, a, an issue with hydrates, but in the evening, hydrates will form for you. So if you're collecting your data on a monthly basis, for example, or on a weekly basis, you've missed the opportunity to understand that hydrate will perform for, will, will, will occur. So you're delayed on performing the right action on preventing hydrates from occurring on the field, right? But if you're collecting your data, let's say an hourly basis, it means that when your temperature start to drop, 25, 20, 15, you're able to see or the digital twin will, will, will simulate for you that with this changes in the environmental aspects, hydrate will form. So you're able to take an action as quick as possible before that uh, criteria or that actions, the, the, the hydrate forms for you. 
let's say that you're working in an environment where ESP, where you have an ESP pump and you collect the data. I've seen some operators, for example, that they collect the data on monthly basis. If your ESP uh, speed needs to be reduced because of any uh, issue that occurs within the well, you're delayed by a month to know that this will happen, uh, that, that this needs, this action needs to be happening for you, which means that in a month, you might need to actually replace the ESP pump. So that's an additional cost. So that's the benefit of managing operation in real time. The third part is conducting simulations and experiments. This is hugely important. What does that mean? Reservoir engineers will understand this very well because reservoir engineers spend ages and ages looking into eclipse and intersects to simulate the behavior of the field so that they can come when, with, with recommendations and actions before even a field is being developed. Now, what happens after this, when, when, when you're doing a new uh, field development, for example, is that you start implementing these actions. But again, as we said, Sometimes you're not taking uh, into consideration the restrictions coming from um, um, the downstream, for example, because eclipse or intersect or any simulation, uh, in a matter of fact, needs to be linked to, to, to another simulator, uh, like, uh, like Pipeson, for example, or, or like Hysis, to, to be able to, to, to give you the information uh, a statistic information, by the way, because this is not a real-time uh, simulation, right? So you're going to miss opportunities to understand the real behavior of the field. <clears throat> but what happens when you have a digital twin is that, as we said, you're creating a, a uniform environment uh, representing the full field. So you're looking into your reservoir, you're looking into your, uh, your uh, wells, you're look, looking into the pipelines, you're looking into the facilities. So you're able to use near or real time. When I say near, it's because not all the companies requires to use seconds, for example, you can use hour. So that's a near real time data. So you're using real time data or near real time data to create a simulation and understand the behavior. Just to give you a, a very simple uh, example, in one of the fields in Africa, when they were trying to uh, uh, design how many risers they need uh, on the field, they come up with uh, reservoir engineers and, and uh, production engineers, they come up with 12 risers to, to, to be implemented or to be installed on the field by only by uh, creating an integration between uh, reservoir, um, reservoir completions, wells, pipeline, and facilities, we were able to reduce from 12 to eight risers. The cost was reduced by $40 million. So you can imagine saving $40 million by preventing a wrong design, just because you created or you, will you were able to, to experiment this design before you implemented the field. The fourth part is improve trustworthiness. What does that mean? It, it's very, very, very simple. When I was a production engineer, every time I come up with a, with a recommendation, and I try to present it to uh, geologists or try to present it uh, to, to reservoir engineers, we go into the debate of what type of data we are you using, uh, which type of simulation are you using, uh, but you didn't use the new information that I provided to you, but I am using uh, an analytical simulation instead of uh, a different simulation, uh, but we cannot use OFM for this, and I prefer to use Eclipse for that. This is a debate that, and it's a very healthy debate that all of us are doing uh, because we are not using the same data and we are not using the same uh, application. But when you're working alongside with other engineers, they trust the information that you provide because they trust that they are using the same database, they trust that they are using the same applications, they trust that the algorithm is the same for all the applications that's being used. 
And the, 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 the last part is enable collaboration, which we talked about, right? Uh, your management uh, trust what you present because they are able also to view uh, the performance. Your asset manager is able to understand the task of each person and there is no overlap of uh, what all of us are doing at the same time. Now, let's give a practical examples of how producers uh, like Shell, like Equinor, like Total, uh, e E&I are using uh, or taking advantage of digital twin. The first part is gaining information in a real time of health equipment. I'm gonna give you a, an example. A single pump failure in an offshore rig can cost producers anywhere from $100,000 to $300,000 per day. So if you're gonna spend 15 days uh, to, to install a new uh, pump and uh, um, uh, try it and make sure that it's working properly, you can imagine how much uh, dollars you're losing on those 15 days if, you, if, if this is how you're losing. And this is a loss in production. With data from sensors, engineers can eliminate hours of troubleshooting, directing on-site crews to the source of issues in minutes so they can quickly bring the platform back up, back up to full productivity. A second example is detecting faults and predicting remaining useful life of assets. By running the massive amount of data generated by, for example, gas processing units with sensors through deep learning and artificial intelligence technology, digital twins can help producers get ahead of many issues they can also provide guidance on the parts and skills that will be needed to service problematic assets, as well as the work field service teams will be required to perform. This is another example. A third example, which is very, very widely used right now with a, with, with a, with a technology called drill plan, is reducing non-productive drilling time using real-time data gathered on location as drilling occurs, along with edge analytics that comp compare, compare it to the producer's historical data and outcomes in similar projects, organizations can make better and faster decisions that improve overall drilling performance while keeping drilling productivity high. Now let's talk about types of digital twins. We have three types of digital twins. The first part is status twin. Status twin is typically used for basic condition monitoring applications, such as dashboards, simple alerting systems. It indicates the operating parameters and it generally created, it generally created with visualization tools. What does that mean? It means that here, for example, I can see the performance of the well. Which wells are idle? Which wells are, are flowing naturally? Which wells are not flowing? Which wells are, are bland for shut-in, for example? Here I'm seeing on, on, uh, on daily, uh, on daily, on year to date, on month to date, on year to date, how much is my production in oil, in gas, in water? I'm looking into the performance of the well, uh, um, the temperature, the pressure, the production. I'm also looking, if you're an asset manager, you're looking into tasks. What, does, what do I mean by task? It means that if, if your team is performing specific tasks, uh, intervention, uh, or looking into uh, diag specific diagnostic on a well, you're seeing which one are delayed, which one are new, which one are delayed by a month, which one are approved, for example, which one are rejected. So you're able to see the status of uh, your information of the well. Or for example, here I have a, a, an ESP pump. I'm able to see which pump is shut in or which pump is not working, for example. This, this gives me so the well is flowing, right? But the pump status is in red, which means that there is a problematic issues with this pump. I'm able to see also the, the performance. And here, if you compare this well to the other wells, for example, you can see that uh, the well hit, uh, well hit pressure is, is low uh, compared to the other wells. And, and you can view uh, what, what are the issues related to this well. Another example can be related to the data. 
you are able to see the sensor's performance of, uh, of the well. So here, for example, it's giving you the, the well head pressure not recorded in 10 hours. So you need to uh, see if you have an issue with the sensors or if you have issue with the data management itself, the data management uh, tool itself, right? So, uh, um, so it gives you an indication of the data, inactive data and active data. It can be as simple as that, right? So this is what we call a status twin. Now, another example that we will see is operational twin. Now, operational twin, twin provides more extensive information that is typically used in decision support by operators, reliability engineers, and other decision makers. It's linked to a set of actions or workflows where users can interact with the twin and change operating parameters, where control capability is allowed. What does that mean? It means that here in the example I'm seeing, this is gas lift allocation. I'm using a simulator or an algorithm that allocate the gas injection of gas into my wells <coughs> and compare it to the, the real allocation that you are doing in the field. And it's giving you an action that, uh, that you need to do. So for example, this in blue is the initial uh, injection that you're doing. The optimized injection is the yellow one. So for example, this well, the, 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 the action from the, from the inside is to reduce the gas injection. You can save money by reducing how much gas you're injecting into this well. In this well, the opposite. You need to increase the injection of the gas so that you can increase production. So, and then this action, as we said, uh, or this insight, as we said before, it can be translated into action. It can be done automatically, or it can be done by intervention by you as an engineer. Another example here is uh, recommendations given by engineers to the field. So uh, I have a recommendation to reduce a choke, or I have a recommendation to uh, perform a well test or take a sample from the well. So those are all recommendations, operational recommendations that can be given to, uh, to, the, to, to the management or to the asset manager perform in the, in the well. This bridge the gap between engineers on the office and engineers on the field, because usually uh, uh, an engineer on the field is uh, the one who takes action, the one who performs the action. An engineer on the office is the one responsible for creating, for analyzing the performance of the well. Another example is what we talked about last uh, session, which is creating an optimization for the well, an opportunity for the well. So, here, an action is being given that those three wells are uh, positively, will positively impact your uh, production if an intervention is being created. And this is the type of intervention that's being recommended, squeezing, uh, uh, acidization, whatever type of recommendation is being presented by the machine to you. The third and last part that we're going to talk about is simulation point. Simulation twin is leverages different type of simulation or artificial intelligence capabilities to predict, forecast, or provide insight into future operational status. You can use it for predictive maintenance or to improve the recovery yield of a processing plant. What does that mean? It means that this is different from the previous one. The previous one was the actions that you should take okay, right now based on the condition, the current conditions of the well or the field. This one is the future condition of the well. So here I'm looking, I'm using Python, for example, to see if I change, if I add a well, a new well, or if I change, if I create, if I add an ESP pump, will my operating condition change and how do I adjust it to, uh, to have more production or to optimize my production? Another example, if I create from the previous operational action, it's giving me that you should do acidization or, or cementing, for example, or, or any type of intervention. I'm using a simulation or artificial intelligence to create forecast and see, all right, very good. With the current condition, it's going to give me production. But if I change the conditions, will this intervention provide what I need or not? 
do I need to change uh, uh, in the future? This intervention uh, will provide a yield for me or not? Another third example. Here I'm using uh, uh, a well-designed methodology to see uh, the performance of, of the well and to understand uh, uh, if I use an ESP coming from Schlumberger, for example, uh, in the future. Uh, so I have a natural well flowing and I'm going to change and, and uh, provide an ESP pump. What's the operating condition? How can I adjust this? Uh, to get me to optimize my well. So simulation twin is uh, used to predict the future status when you change something in your well. Now, a very important thought is how to use artificial intelligence and machine learning in a digital twin. Do all digital twins need an element of artificial intelligence and machine learning? No. Very clear. No. Why? Because simply you might uh, have a brown field with, uh, with, with, a, with, a, with a huge uh, history, for example, that enables you to understand the performance of your field or your well without the need to use artificial intelligence. Or you might not be in the, in the status of wanting to, to, to predict. You just want to know the status of what you have. But for this section, we're talking about how to use artificial uh, intelligence and machine learning in digital twin. And the first part is to talk about real-time analytics. As a digital twin ingests data in real time, it can apply artificial intelligence and machine learning to look for anomalous behavior, different behavior than what the well is doing, predict future states and optimize production. This advanced real-time analytics is the first step to getting the most value out of your digital twin. What does that mean? Here, I'm looking into my pipeline's performance. <clears throat> Is it better to root in the future when I add a new well or three or four wells? Where do I reroot the production of this well? Do I put it into this specific flow line, this gathering center? What's the performance? So it predicts for you uh, uh, the best scenario on how to reroute, for example, this is an example, how to reroute the future well production. Another example is decision support. This additional layer of intelligence can be used to display prediction from your digital twin. It provides a decision support for your engineers when they need to make real-time decisions by providing details and predictions about metrics like remaining useful life or stock levels you can empower your team to respond faster to critical business events uh, uh, that, that, that happens on your field. So as we said, decision support, collaboration between different teams is something that is enabled more by uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in digital tools. A very important part is perspective analysis, prescriptive analytics, and recommendation. The perspective analytics is uh, a step further from prediction. What does it mean? It means that in the future, when I change, <clears throat> so prediction means this is my status of the well, predict for me or show me what will happen next in a, in a, in a month or in, a, in, a, in, in two months when <clears throat> the status is at, as it is. The, pres pres the prescriptive is different. Prescriptive Prescriptive is what actions do I need to do or to change on my field or my well to be able to get a better result or an optimum result than what I'm getting, getting right now. This is the final way to, to leveraging artificial intelligence and machine learning in your digital twin. To use them for prescriptive analytics and to create recommendations on the best action to take next based on the predictions. In this scenario, your digital twin will do more than provide you with real-time status updates. It will help you and your team take the actions that are most likely to produce the best result based on real-time data. You might use a digital twin to predict, uh, for example, to predict uh, a stock level at a different nodes of your supply chain or predict 
the remaining lifetime of an ESP pump. Artificial intelligence and machine learning provide the essential capabilities to help you maximize the value you get from your digital twin. Now, what feeds a digital twin? You will hear this word, word a lot, feeding a digital twin or feeding the, the, the artificial uh, intelligence algorithm behind uh, the digital twin or you will hear the word artificial neural network, which is the algorithm that's being used on uh, any uh, machine learning behavior. Remember the digital twin is made up of data, typically collected from a variety of sources such as sensors, control systems, historians, weather data, and more. All this data is collected in a data lake in the cloud. A data lake is basically not a data management tool. It's bigger than a data management. It's a place on the cloud where you have your data management tools. <clears throat> you have your, your uh, um, relationship between your data and your workflows being stored and being organized and being uh, uh, interpreted together. <clears throat> Apology for that. <clears throat> So this is what we call a data lake, or you will hear a data ecosystem. The data, data is cleansed, verified for quality, and then fed to the physics models for processing, interpretation, and to provide insight. The sensors, control systems, and historians are typically hardware in the plant sites, and all the rest is software. Uh, software. For example, uh, there is an EPC contractor called McDermott. They leverage the data from existing systems on a platform, such as supervisory control and data acquisitions called SCADA, and programmable logical controls, it's called PLC, while looking at edge computing enabled sensors on facilities where there are bandwidth limitations. Right, so they are in discussion with multiple partners in order to enable data collection, aggregation, storage, and visual analysis for that twin. To, to simplify this, technology uh, uh, has been evolved to, from traditional physics model, uh, uh, the ones that you are using like Eclipse Petrel, and, and then the data-driven machine learning models, for all phases of the asset life cycle, design, fabrication, installation, operation. These models are digital replicas, uh, replicate the physical assets and can be used in condition assessments of a variety of assets. The artificial uh, neural network, as an example, is supervised learning that is considered reliable and efficient method to creating a twin. You feed all the history. Let's assume that you want to do, uh, as we, we spoke on the last session, we were um, looking into the, success, the chances of success to create a specific intervention for the well. An artificial neural network model is being fed the history of the, the intervention of each well. And this used, using this feed, the, pro, uh, the, the, the machine can give you the success of chances of uh, specific process within the web. Now let's talk about some uh, examples of digital, uh, of digital uh, twin. And I'm gonna use a solution that we had, which is called Agora. As, as some examples, we will talk about data delivery, uh, how to use digital twin in data delivery, how to use digital twin on well completions, in production operation, in midstream facilities and in safety. Very quickly, we're gonna go around through them. Data delivery as a, as a beginning. We provide two options here, for example, to connect any sensor, deliver data to the cloud, or to use a camera to read values from analog uh, gauges to deliver digital data into the real time. For example, here, yeah. What are the challenges when it comes to data delivery and visualization? First of all, you don't have real-time data. 
uh, you, or, or, or in some cases, you have too many real-time data that you are unable to visualize it or understand or make a sense of the data that you have. You don't have the data connected between workflows and between the applications. So um, there is no benefit really of having uh, 300 reads of pressure per day or, or, or 10,000 reads of temperature every day. This will complicate your life. So what we provide here is a simple uh, visualization for, for, for some parts, as we said, for the well, for, for the daily production, uh, uh, for your production performance, uh, for your pump classifications, that will give you uh, um, an idea of the behavior of this well or the behavior of the entity that you're representing. Another example is what if you have gauges, uh, but it provides a manual data gathering, right? Or you, you have to, 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 to do a data, someone will go to the field every two days or every week. To, to gather manual data for you. Uh, this will provide, of course, a risk, uh, uh, HSE risk uh, for your personnel and in the field. And it will also give you, as we spoke before, you, you're missing opportunity by not looking into real-time data. Solution is very simple. Cameras that can, uh, so we don't, again, when you implement a digital twin or, or, or implementing digitalization, you try to reduce the cost as much as possible. So <clears throat> in that case, you have the digital analog and you're very happy with the performance. So you don't want to replace this with the real-time sensors, for example. But simply you can just install a camera that can look into the analog gauge and provide this information into the field without sending your personnel into the field to collect the data manually. So you're, you're basically reducing expensive and risky trips. You're simply looking into high accuracy visualization of the data on, on a minute basis, in case any changes on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the behavior of, of those gauges. That's an example of, <clears throat> of data delivery. Let's take an example of well completions. In well completions, you might be looking into frack monitoring, you might be looking into pump down perforation. <clears throat> Flow back monitoring, digital production, trees, many, many inputs that you're looking at. So let's talk about flow back, uh, flow back for example. Uh, how you can do, what, why you should do real time monitoring and workflow. The challenges that you have when you, when you spoke about flow back is that, uh, uh, first of all, you have lack of visibility of the jobs of, uh, that are being performed uh, on, your, on your field. You have manual data error coming from manual data and uh, reporting. Uh, you have uh, over or under uh, flowback leading to sending or lost in production. But what you can do is, is something very simple. First of all, uh, you can centralize the data collection from all equipment into a single device. So you have all the real-time data available for you for access by all the stakeholders or all the engineers working in this process for reporting and for visualization, you're able to uh, have an insight, <clears throat> insight that provides you uh, on the status of the flowback. So you're reducing the errors based on the manual entry that you have. You're optimizing the flowback period to avoid any sending or increase, uh, uh, or increase or reduction in production. Or you're also reducing uh, the risky trips for personnel to provide the manual trips. HSE uh, is very important in oil and gas, and all the oil and gas companies have an objective to reduce HSE into zero. Uh, for, for companies that are working on unconventional uh, ADNO or, or Aramco or in the United States and Canada, uh, they have lots of challenges when it comes to, again, manual data, uh, proper communication between the field and the office, uh, that the that, that costs uh, that provide high costs, uh, unnecessarily high costs uh, because of loss, loss of information. Uh, the, effort, uh, the effort that companies are, are, are putting huge amount of money into data reconciliation, of course, many sources, which reduce 
the amount uh, which increase the amount of time uh, they are spending in operation and HSP reduction. Just by simply uh, providing real time information on the edge of the crack operation, how much material is uh, is is uh, available for you, uh, the stocks of uh, of the material, uh, even looking into the fleet um, uh, productivity is something that's very important. Integrating the KPIs with the pad level, this all reduce the error involved in manual entries. It reduces, it optimizes the number of stages um, in uh, of track stages required for this operation. Um, if we look into pump, pump down perforating, for example, when you look into the pump, you don't have connectivity, you don't have automation, you don't have um, a proper data acquisition and a proper data exchange between field and uh, office. So if you're able to install sensors, if you're able to install edge properly uh, installed, you're able to uh, reduce the incidents that pump off because as we said before, you don't need to wait a month until someone go and check uh, the pump manually. You're able to see real time data that will provide you uh, minute by minute or second by second or day by day, the performance of your pump. And if there is any uh, issues with your pump, you're able to understand that this pump uh, needs uh, to be manipulated as quick as possible to prevent any uh, harm events. Those on a well, uh, some examples, now of course there are many examples, but those are some examples on a well completion level. Now when it comes to production operation, let's see something like the X monitoring, uh, um, looking into well bad flow monitoring, calibration, meter health management to reduce the time and cost of operation. What's, what's the challenges and the issue? The issue is that many times people bring manual uh, meters to provide data gathering. So you perform well testing every month or every six months, for example, um, manually, right? Uh, you need to create a proper calibration also to, to, um, to this meter. Uh, there is an unnecessary HSP exposure uh, when you bring manual pe uh, people manually to perform this task. So when you have uh, a proper um, meter in a school in your, um, in your well uh, or in your site, you have a minute by minute data um, read, uh, ready for you to, 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 to interpret. You have an intelligent real time well management that enables remotely uh, at the edge means that remotely you can choke the well, remotely you can uh, do, um, uh, remember we talked about, we talked about the actuator, so remotely can perform behavior changes on the well. Um, you have the data on your mobile, on your iPad, on your PC, and instead of having to go all the way to the field, especially if you have a complicated um, a complicated uh, field settings, like in Indonesia, for example, where you're in the middle of the jungle and you need a helicopter to transfer you between the field and the office. So, it, so you're able to reduce field visits by 30%, uh, reducing the HSE risks uh, with those engineers. Uh, the maintenance is well maintained and it's uh, much more uh, managed, you're, you're reducing the time required for maintaining maintain, well maintenance. And you, of course, you're optimizing production because rather than looking into uh, uh, monthly data, you're looking into minute by minute data. Another example related to road pumps, especially in the, in the United States. The United States uh, have the highest number of road pumps installed in the worldwide. And uh, many of them um, manually or manually managed. So you don't have uh, good quality of the data. So you're not able to, to, to understand uh, the, the behavior of the pump um, and connect this data into specific production workflows related to our pump. Even when you look into many of our production softwares worldwide, 
we care more for some reason into ESP pumps uh, and PCP more than even rod pumps. So by connecting um, real-time data into uh, data analytics at the edge with the right uh, algorithm and the right logic, control logic on the edge, you're able to control your growth pumps as quick as possible. So you're improving the uptime of the, of the pump and you're optimizing your production as quick as possible. And also quickly you're identifying any risk for pump failure. Now looking into two examples of midstream facilities. One example is gas membranes production. Here you have uh, in the facility, you're looking into manual data extraction for handling data of heavy calculations. By just by installing real-time monitoring, you're able or on the facility equipment, you you're able to do machine learning uh, at the edge. So you're able to do analytics analytics uh, on the on the well and uh, uh, manage your insights as quick as possible. What does that mean? It means that, especially on the membrane system, it increases the reliability and efficiency. You don't need to change uh, this uh, every month or every six months. You're able to understand the life uh, of the membranes and the behavior, uh, making use of its life. You simplify the analysis, the collaboration, and the operational troubleshooting with a cross-functional dashboard. Uh, one, one of my favorite um, topics is uh, player monitoring, especially in the Middle East. When I was working with KOC, this was a huge issue. How can we reduce flaring? Uh, and, and I know we focus a lot on the well, we focus a lot on the reservoir, but um, reducing uh, carbon footprint is something very important. We're always, as an oil and gas industry, we, we are always accused of increasing um, carbon footprint worldwide. So we're not green energy, uh, as like renewable, for example, on other uh, electrical cars and other industries. And this is one of the challenges that we're trying to change with the digital twin, is how do we become more green? How do we, we become more efficient? How do we reduce the carbon footprint? And the challenge that, uh, especially in the Middle East, we have is how do we monitor a large number of flare stacks? How do we ensure compliance with the regulations? How do we reduce the large spend that we do when it comes to maintenance and compliance? And <clears throat> by simply installing sensors for fusion uh, and real-time videos <clears throat> and audio analysis for flare feeds, you're able, using the, the neural networks, you're able to uh, uh, monitor the player uh, that you have on each facility. You're able to understand the performance and you're able to optimize the, this performance and uh, improve the safety and lower the optics and maintenance costs. My last example comes to safety and environment. And by the way, uh, uh, the clearing the is in between the midstream facilities and also in the city environment. But let's see into pipeline leak detection. This is one of my favorite topics because as a production engineer, I have worked a lot on trying with other companies to find uh, a solution on how to predict leak or how do we know that the pipeline is leaking without having to, to use uh, uh, nuclear traces without having to use to send someone every month or every two months to uh, to detect that there is a leak or not um, mainly because it's costing and also because it, it we, we usually we failed to do that but usually we have to wait until we discover that production is actually lost what happens most of the time in in, in my old times was that you're producing your well is, uh, sensors from the well sink that you produce 500 barrels per day. What to each your gathering center is 200 barrels per day. Where is the rest of the 300 barrels? And we discovered that there is a leak in the pipeline. Many, many uh, inventions have been done. Not only what we present right now is using the edge analytics and sensors, 
uh, to communicate wireless, wirelessly, but also the use of drones and cameras. Right now, there's a huge uh, invention when it comes to drones to monitor uh, pipeline leak detection. Satellites also is being used to monitor uh, pipeline detection. So uh, the, the, what I'm presenting right now is our solution, the Schlumberger solution, which is the use <coughs> of, uh, of wireless uh, set acoustic sensors to provide, um, to provide uh, changes on the behavior of the fluid uh, and any anomalies within each 15 minutes. But I urge you also to look into drones and cameras uh, that are being used uh, with the many startups uh, in the U.S. How this will help you, of course, uh, as, as you can see, you're, every 15 minutes you can see the changes in behavior. So within an hour or two hours, you can take a decision to, to, to change the pipeline or, or, uh, or see where is the issues that's happening. Well, not even change the pipeline because if you're detecting everything each 15 minutes, it means that if you have a minor issue, you can solve it before you rely on costly uh, methodologies like changing uh, a whole pipeline or reroute uh, the production of the well to another pipeline until you fix uh, the issue that you have on this pipeline. We come to the end of my presentation. Sorry, I took extra 16 minutes, uh, but I hope, uh, I hope it was effective and uh, easy to, to, uh, to understand what's a digital twin. So that when you hear this uh, on, the, on the field, you know that it's not as complicated as people view it. It's not as difficult as people view it. It's basically the make, making the use, making a, a, a representation of your physical asset or your physical entity, a will, a field, an ESP pump, uh, uh, a rig, within the digital so that you can experiment and play with it digitally before you, you take a costly effective decisions on your field. Um, thank you very much all for listening to that. Ahmed, I'm, I'm ready to take any questions uh, related to... Thank you, Engineer Marwa, for the uh, presentation. It was excellent as usual. Um, uh, it was really very comprehensive. I, I did not receive any questions. Just I want to mention something for our audience. The quiz will be posted within uh, one hour from now. So, uh, and this is the third lecture. And the last lecture will be next uh, Thursday. So please uh, submit a quiz on time and do your final. You must get 70% uh, or above to receive your certificate. Best of luck for all and have a wonderful uh, rest of the day. Bye.